Hello, in this video we're going to be talking about electric charge and the electric force, the beginning of our topic 5, electric field unit. We've talked about gravitational field, gravitational force, and mass, and so now we're going to look at the electric cousins of those ideas. All right, so what is charge? Well, charge is hard to define because charge, it turns out, is a very fundamental property of matter, just like mass. Uh, I would argue you can't really come up with a good satisfying definition of charge in the same way that you can't really come up with a good satisfying definition of mass. Go ahead, try it. Try and define mass without like having to use the word mass. Uh, it's really just the fundamental things. All matter has some kind of charge and has some kind of mass, it turns out. Um, when we talk about what matter is. So maybe one of the best ways to think of charge is what you're probably familiar with from your um, middle school or chemistry days, which is the idea of what's going on inside of an atom, that we have these subatomic particles, protons, neutrons, and electrons, that um, is usually the first time you're exposed to this idea of charge. So there's two types of charge, positive and negative. That's a big difference between uh, electric stuff and gravity stuff. Uh, all right, but so there's two types, positives and negatives. Um, and a very basic picture of the atom, which is the good enough for now to say the smallest uh, smallest kind of thing that makes up matter. Um, everything's made of atoms. And an atom has a nucleus with protons and neutrons uh, and a very, very, very dense ball in the middle here. This is definitely not to scale. And electrons uh, orbiting around or something like that. Okay, so electrons are the negatively charged particles and protons are the positively charged particles. All right, um, so one of the key ideas in terms of how charge works and transfers is that there are certain materials called conductors in which electrons are free to move. Um, the electrons are the things on the outside of the atom that can be can move between atoms, between objects, between substances. So electrons are the things that can be kind of transferred between objects. This is how charge can move. Um, protons can't move. So electrons we often call charge carriers. Okay, so again, here's the idea. The electrons can be transferred sometimes by friction. One of the most common examples of where you see electricity in your everyday life is rubbing your socks on the carpet. Um, or, you know, getting up from a, from a car seat, a cloth car seat, and your clothes are rubbing on the seat or something, um, and you get a little charred, you touch a doorknob or something metal, and you feel a little shock. Well, what happened is friction between, say, your socks and the carpet pulled some of these electrons off of the carpet, let's say, and you accumulated that extra little bit of charge then on your body, and um, by gaining some extra electrons, you now have a negative charge. Whereas if the object loses electrons, it ends up with a positive charge. So it's all about the motion of electrons. If you gain extra electrons, you have a net negative charge. And if you lose electrons, you have a positive charge. All right, some other things about charge. The unit of charge is the Coulomb, uh, or Coulombs. This is capital C is the symbol for this unit. And you can think of this it's like the kilogram of charge, all right? We measure mass in kilograms, we measure charge in coulombs. So one coulomb of charge is a lot of charge. It's a very, very, very deadly amount of charge. And um, the one charge amount you're gonna become very familiar is the elementary charge, named because it is the charge of every, well, each of our basic elementary particles, the electron and the proton. So the electron and proton both have this much charge that for the electron, it's a negative amount for the proton, it's positive. But so it's 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Also, for sure, in the front of your data booklet is this value. All right, so a proton has this much charge and an electron has negative 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs of charge. So just for context, here's a sort of basic way you can picture an electron. Now, whether the best picture of an electron is a little ball or something like this is uh, something we'll get to another day. Probably good enough for now, though. So electron is a really, really, really little thing, a little bit of matter that's got uh, that much charge. And also, just to give you some kind of scale of things, is it has about 9 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms of mass. Teeny, teeny, tiny. Right. And if this helps at all, a proton is about 10 to the minus 27 kilograms. 
So much bigger than this, but still, you know, subatomic. Okay. So electric charge is something you're kind of familiar with in your everyday life, but when it happens, it seems uh, spooky or weird or exciting because it doesn't happen very often at all because most stuff is neutral. Um, because we have positive and negative charges, the electric effects in our everyday life are almost always canceled out on our macroscopic scale. So because most stuff like your body and the table in front of you and everything uh, just about that you touch and interact with has the same number of protons and electrons, it's electrically neutral. You've got no net charge. Your body has no net charge. And if you do gain a net charge, your body hates it. Um, and wants to get rid of that net charge as quick as possible. So if you rub your socks on the carpet and scoop up a couple extra electrons, the next time you touch a conductor, those electrons are going to escape your body because they hate hate being uh, built up. All right, You're, all macroscopic objects do not like having a net charge and will get rid of it as quick as they can. All right, but when we do see things that are charged, what we see is the way that these interact. And so what happens is, of course, opposites attract and like charges repel. So I have a positively charged thing and a negatively charged thing. They're going to attract each other. They're going to be pulled towards each other. Two positives will repel, two negatives will repel. I did a little fun experiment in class with tape. This is supposed to be a picture of the tape um, where I can pull, put two pieces of scotch tape on a, on a table in front of you, yank them off. They'll both gain the same kind of charge. And if you bring them close to each other, they'll repel and then you can do the thing too. Put one piece of tape on top of the other piece of tape, pull them off the table, then separate them. One pulls electrons off of the other. So one ends up positive, one ends up negative, and you will see amazingly, they will attract each other. All right, fun little silly experiment you can do that shows this idea of plus or minus charge and how we transfer charge. Okay, um, this is an activity we did in class and I encourage you to uh, do if you're you know, making this up or looking at this in the future. The simulation from FET, just look up the FET sim on Coulomb's Law and play around with it. You'll notice a lot of similarities to how the gravity works, like we learned with LUG, the Law of Universal Gravitation, and maybe a couple differences. So I encourage you to play with that sim. Think about that. How is it the same? How is it similar? And how is it different? All right. What you'll see as you look at how charges interact and how two masses interact is that there's a lot of similarities um coulomb's law is the equation that tells us the size of an electric force between two charges uh, you will probably notice that the structure of this equation is very familiar it looks a whole lot like the law of universal gravitation which tells us the force of gravity between two masses all right this is the electric force between two charges and well it's basically the same equation swap out your m's for q's and swap out your big g for a k and you got the same thing all right so it obeys an inverse square law. As I pull the two charges further apart, the force will decrease um, with 1 over r squared. Uh, the product of the charges makes a difference. So the bigger the charges, the bigger the force. And there's some kind of constant out front. Okay. Um, one thing to note is that this equation just gives you the magnitude, just like Lug does. You need to decide what the direction of those forces are based on the charges. If they're both positives, they're going to repel. If they're both negatives, they're going to repel. If one's a positive, when one's a negative, they're going to attract. So don't bother putting in pluses and minuses to this equation. Um, much easier to just put in the magnitudes of the charges and you decide with your knowledge of physics and how things attract and repel what the direction of the force is going to be. All right, K is a number in front of your data booklet. It's this big. Now here's one other difference between uh, the electric force and the gravitational force. K is this big most of the time. In 90 plus percent of the problems you ever see, K is this value. But K does depend on some stuff, mainly where you are. Turns out this is the constant as long as you were like in a vacuum, like in space. So that constant assumes that we're in a vacuum. Uh, it does also work if you're in air because air is pretty close to a vacuum compared to other materials like uh, essentially you could do problems where you have charges, I don't know, underwater or something crazy like that. So this is an equation in the data booklet that you will probably forget about because you use it so infrequently. 
it turns out this constant is defined in terms of some other constant, which is called epsilon naught. It's called the permittivity of free space. Oh, fun. Um, oops, all right. The, that value is in the front of your data booklet, the permittivity of free space. And if you do one divided by four pi times that constant, look, it turns out you get the K constant, that 8.99 times 10 to the nine. Um, the only reason they give you this equation, and it's a little funky the way they give it to you, but uh, you might, might see a problem where they throw something weird at you, like say, here's a couple of point charges underwater where the permittivity is some number. So if they do that, you have to calculate your own K constant which will be one divided by four pi times whatever they give you for this permittivity. Um, all right, so you do one divided by four pi times whatever they tell you for permittivity. That would give you a K, assuming that you're not in a vacuum or in the air. In every other case though, you just use this number for K. And that's gonna be almost every problem you ever see. All right, very rarely do you have to worry about dealing with that, that other piece of it. But just to know what this equation is for and what it maybe will come up, that's the idea. All right, so Coulomb's law is sometimes written like this. This is probably a more thorough way to say it. One divided by four pi epsilon, where this is the permittivity of the material. And if you're in a vacuum or in the air, um, you can assume that you're dealing with the permittivity of free space. And so you end up with the K constant in the front of the data booklet. All right, again, nothing to sweat too much because that rarely comes up. Most of the time, you're just going to use the K in the front of the data booklet and call it a day. And one other equation worth going over in this section, because it's very similar to the lug stuff, is our definition of an electric field. You'll notice the way we define it is almost identical to how we define a gravitational field. So just like a, a mass creates a field all around it uh, that we define as the force per unit mass acting on the small point mass in the field, we do the same thing with an electric field. We say these pluses and minuses can push and pull on each other at a distance because they create electric field all around them. The size of that electric field is defined as the force per unit charge acting on a small point charge placed at that point in the field. All right, so we have a very similar equation. In lug, we had little g equals F over little m. So here we're gonna have E, the electric field strength, equals F, the electric force, divided by little q, the charge on the object. All right, same exact idea. Now this is gonna be measured in newtons per coulomb. One thing to note, is that I could do the same thing we did with gravity. If you remember, when we did this with gravity, we did little g equals f over little m. We plugged in lug, g times big M times little m over r squared for f, and found something like g, little g, equals big G times big M over r squared. That's a really useful equation where we're doing our ratio problems and saying you go to a planet and you go two times farther away from the planet. How does the field strength change, all that stuff. Again, we can do the same exact thing math-wise for electric fields. I can put in Coulomb's law up here, KQQ over R squared. And the Q in the field will be canceled out, leaving me only the Q making the field. All right, so you can do the same process, saying the electric field strength is equal to Coulomb's constant times the charge making the field, so the quantity of the charge making the field measured in Coulombs, divided by the distance to the charge squared. All right, just note, for whatever reason, this is not in your data booklet. They give you like the G version of this equation in topic five, sorry, in topic six, but they don't give you the E version of this equation in topic five, which is a little annoying. So you wanna remember that you can do this. This is a really useful equation to know that you can use, but this is one of a few that is not really in your data booklet. All right, so remember you can do that. The good news is the math process of most of this electric force and field stuff is identical to the math process of the gravity force and field stuff because you can see that they behave in very much the same ways. Uh, the plus and minus adds a little bit more fun and um, conceptually, we gotta wrap our heads around this idea of an electric force being a different thing than a gravitational force, but math-wise, they work very much the same. So we will do plenty of practice with them um, to start wrapping our heads around those ideas. So there you go. Until then, have fun.